Thank you, and good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be back at SSE and meet new colleagues and see old ones as well. So first of all, what really is the biofield? This is something I've been working with for almost 40 years now. And it's the field of energy within and around the body. And that energy is imbued with information. Now we have the concept of information in biomolecules, for example, in the hormone receptor or enzyme substrate um, couples. But until recently, people really haven't thought about the energy of the body containing not only useful information, but information that is utilized by the organism and that may also be involved in biocommunication even between organisms and bioregulation. And so I consider the biofield the active organizing field of life and that every organism has a biofield. We're going to talk about the human one today. And this goes back to ancient concepts of a life force and Elan Vital the concept of chi in oriental medicine, um, the concept of prana and Ayurveda or ki in Japanese medicine. And actually, every indigenous culture had a word for this vital force or vital energy. But in science, it was thrown out. And there was an abrupt blow to vitalistic theory in 1845 with the synthesis of the first organic chemical in a laboratory. It was the death blow to vitalism. And ever since then, it's been a mechanistic view uh, biology, living systems are nothing but a bag of biomolecules, largely, and elucidating those biomolecules became the game of biology. But we still have concepts of vital force, life energy, etc., in most of our alternative and complementary medicines, and now called integrative therapies, such as chiropractic, osteopathic uh, medicine, and there are many other medical modalities that hold uh, to this and that actually work toward enhancing the biofield. And we have a whole range of so-called biofield therapies in complementary medicine as well. So this is really the biophysics of the energy fields of life and that energy fields both internal to the body and external um, may be fundamental to, fundamental to life and that the biofield is an active organizer involved in bioregulation and biocommunication. And I wrote about this first in 2002 in the biofield hypothesis, but I'm standing on the shoulders of giants because there were many who gave voice to it, calling it different things, electrodynamic field of life uh, and vi the vital force uh, centuries ago. Today, we think about the biofield as being composed of conventional electric, magnetic, electromagnetic, acoustic, and possibly more subtle energy fields that go beyond conventional concepts of science. Now, I think about the biofield as a very complex, dynamic, standing wave pattern. And I'm showing you here the beautiful art by Alex Gray, who kind of visualizes, um, as an artist, how I think about the biofield as a scientist. But of course, living systems are far from equilibrium. Uh, so we're talking about nonlinear, dynamic energy systems. And there's numerous emitters within the living system from the level of ions, uh, moving charges in the body, of course, give rise to magnetic fields. That's conventional physics. And then we have uh, emitters at the level of tissues, organs, and whole systems, the brain, for example, and the heart. And probably the human biofield may be the most complex, dynamical, which means changing energy field that we know of, at least on Earth. So there's certainly useful information in the biofield, and part of the biofield is already well known and utilized in conventional medicine in the electroencephalogram and the electrocardiogram and the ma magnetic equivalents of them, and more recently in thermography uh, to visualize inflammation in tissues. For example, breast thermography may detect hot spots uh, related to cancer or abnormalities in the tissues. So it gives us a functional status as well as a medical diagnosis. But wait, there's more. There's much more to the biofield than conventional medicine has embraced. And that's what I'm talking about in particular today. So there was a, a, a window of opportunity at the US National Institutes of Health to study the biofield, the other aspects of the biofield, the more unconventional aspects. I was part of a formative committee back in the early 90s and the uh, Office of Alternative Medicine 
that hosted several conferences to basically map alternative and complementary medicine. And I led the group that formed the concept of biofield to, un, to help us understand manual healing, energy healing modalities such as Reiki, therapeutic touch, healing touch, quantum touch, and there's a plethora of these today. Uh, many, numerous practitioners all over the world uh, doing laying on of hands or working with hands in the biofield or even sending distant healing in some of these modalities. So we wrote a chapter in a book published by NIH called Alternative Medicine, Expanding Medical Horizons that was published by the U.S. Government Printing Office in 1995. And we made it an official medical subject heading at the National Library of Medicine in 1996. And that was important because it was before Google and in order to search for this as a scientific term, you needed to go to the National Library of Medicine databases, PubMed.com. So it's there, it's, a, it's an official medical subject heading. And in 1999, NIH requested grant proposals for the first time on biofield science. And there was quite a delay, but finally, NIH awarded grants in this subject for frontier medicine and biofield science, and four center grants throughout the United States were awarded and successfully completed, and then I'm sorry to say that uh, this office and NIH as a whole dropped the ball and failed to stay the leadership organization ushering this field forward. But nonetheless, biofield science uh, continues at a lower level. We don't have the benefit of a leadership organization in the government or any outstanding foundation that I'm aware of ushering this along, but we have an energy view of life that really is complementary to the particle view of life. And of course, we have the principle of complementarity that comes from physics, whereby light is seen as both a particle wave, that the dualistic nature of matter and energy is well accepted, that you can't uh, hold one over the other, that it depends on how you look at it, the questions that you ask. And so yes, indeed, life is biomolecular. And there's a lot of information to be gained by studying that. But on the other hand, life is also a wave, a wave-like form that contains bioinformation as well, uh, held in the field through the modulation, through principles of resonance and entrainment. And this may be a much faster communication system within the organism because it can travel close to the speed of light, whereas, of course, molecules are slow. Uh, and so there's actually evidence for uh, communication that does travel faster than diffusion or nerve uh, impulses in living systems. So here is an example of part of the biofield, the acupuncture system of meridians and points, which are well known. And it's also well known for 50, 60 years now that acupuncture points have higher electrical conductivity than the surrounding tissue, and in fact, Devices such as point finders are utilized to test where exactly is the acupuncture point before someone inserts a needle or does another modality. And a whole a practice called electrodermal testing uh, was born out of this, whereby people electrically test conductivity of acupuncture meridians and look for stressors, uh, bring stressors or bring uh, medicaments close to the body, near the biofield, and find that the conductivity of acupuncture points and meridians changes in response to, for example, uh, homeopathics or remedies that would balance the biofield, normalizes the energy, the electrical conductivity of the system, whereas stressors and wrong medications would throw it off, would make it conduct too much or too little, would be, would be imbalanced. So there are whole practitioners who utilize devices based on electrodermal testing, and I won't say much about it uh, as I'm not really doing practice but scientific research, but there are many types of these devices out there, and they are apparently very successful because people are able to nail uh, problems within the organism and solutions uh, within a single hour, uh, very detailed analyses of people's energy systems. So, in 2002, I wrote up the biofield hypothesis, published it in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, and it's about the dynamic field of the organism consisting of electromagnetic and possibly other more subtle fields uh, within and around it, and that this biofield con contains vital information and is central to the integration of the organism, to, our, to operating as a whole. 
Uh, unlike molecules, which of course have their own individual trajectories, it's very hard to understand the uh, integrity of the organism based on a molecular viewpoint. And that the biofield is, I propose, to be regulating the biochemistry and the physiology of the body to be uh, a super regulator above and beyond uh, that. And that it's also a high-speed wireless communication system. And I would say a bridge between the mind and the body. So according to Oriental Medicine, where the mind goes, where attention, intention, belief, et cetera, go, the chi, the energy flows, and blood follows the chi. So we have first the action of mind, and then the movement of energy, the biofield shifting, and then the changes in blood and flesh follow. And that was known for 5,000 years. Uh, and now people are implementing this in, in integrative medicine today. So what type of measurement techniques are there for the biofield? And here are some that we use at Institute for Frontier Science, uh, my nonprofit lab. We do biophoton counting, which I'll describe. We do high voltage electrophotography uh, using commercial devices. And we've also developed a custom high voltage camera. Um, and I'll describe that as well. And we have a custom, uh, several customized subtle energy detectors that I'll just touch on at the end. I've already mentioned the electrical conductivity of acupuncture meridians, and I won't go further into it. But these are the main measurement techniques today of the biofield. Uh, and there could be m so much more, but it's a start. So first, let me begin with biophoton counting. Um, and we have a custom-built technology using a standard photomultiplier tube, and biophotons are the ultra-weak natural light emitted from the organism. And all organisms emit such light. It was discovered almost 100 years ago by Alexander Gervich, uh, who had onions in a paper bag and noticed when they were together, they seemed to facilitate each other's growth. And then he separated them by various optical blockers and discovered that they were apparently ultraviolet because uh, glass would block the communication, but uh, quartz, which passes UV, would not. So it's been known a long time, um, and we have a schematic here. We have um, the PMT, of course, augments uh, particles of light. It's a single photon counter, and via the photoelectric effect, it magnifies each photon by an electron cascade. And the photoelectric effect, by the way, is what Einstein received a Nobel Prize for. And then this is received by a microcontroller and uh, conveyed to USB so that we have real-time data acquisition of counting photons from the human body. And we have produced a dark closet um, whereby we can have three people in there at once and really study photon emission from different parts of the body or from the whole chamber uh, with several people interacting, say, in energy healing. Uh, Harry Jabs uh, very cleverly did all of this, put all together the technology and made it happen. It was my partner sitting there and also figured out how to make it ventilated, because when we go in there, it's sealed shut. We have to breathe. So he figured out a spiral path to deliver uh, uh, air forced by fans, but blocks light rays. And we use a, a conventional off-the-shelf Hamamatsu photomultiplier tube. Here's the number. SEL refers to select. That's their top of the line. Low dark count, which is important, because the photon emission from the human body is somewhere up to about 100 photons per square centimeter per second. It's very low level. And here's how we apply it, but these are just mock-ups because we have to do it in total darkness. We always have to wear black, and we put the photomultiplier tube without the cap on it directly on the part of the body that we're measuring. And for example, the palm of the hand is a great emitter, the forehead, the third eye, so to speak. And there's the interior of the chamber also painted black to prevent stray light from bouncing around and being counted again. And we showed that the dark count is stable. Here it's about seven counts per second. So nobody's in the box. This is just running the photomultiplier for some five hours. So there's Harry at the control, and he developed all the electronics for uh, capturing the photon count and analyzing it statistically. Here I am in the chamber. Again, we, I have to blacken out as much of my body as possible. I should probably be wearing a burqa. But I at least have a black mask, uh, because the face is a high emitter, so are the hands. Um, but um, here I'm uh, getting ready to measure someone, and they open the door to look. So uh, wearing leather gloves, a black face mask, and always black clothes. So it's interesting. 
that our studies and those of others have validated ancient knowledge about the hands as emitters. So uh, the theosophists knew that there was a minor chakra in the palm of the hand, also called Lao Gung in Oriental Medicine, the palace of work, another one near the wrist, uh, inner gate, and the fingers too were whorls of energy, and they drew that in 100 years ago, and studies such as this image from Kyoto University, time-lapse uh, photography of the fingers show the most emitting fingers are the index and third finger, and also the palms of the hands is well known. And sword fingers uh, like this are used in uh, Taoist practices and qigongs, in healing touch to move energy, to act like lasers really in doing healing work, really moving energy strongly. Uh, and it's amazing that those are the greatest emitters of biophotons from the human body. So we started with some research questions like this. Can we measure a change in biophoton emission from the hands of energy healers before and after they conduct energy therapy? Can we measure a change in biophoton emission from the hands of patients before and after they receive energy therapy? And can we measure biophotons during the energy healing session itself? So we started with those three questions and our, it was a simple research design, an outcome type study with five very advanced biofield practitioners who had practiced between eight and 40 years and pain patients that we randomly assigned and measured in a number of sessions. And they actually performed 20 minutes of energy healing in our chamber and we measured them before, during, and after. So here's an example of one session uh, with healer one, patient one. Uh, we always measured a little baseline of two minutes before um, the baseline of two minutes before the healer palm and then another two minute baseline, the other healer palm right and left, and then another baseline and then we went to patient palms right and left. And then we allowed them to conduct the healing session and we put the detector above the heads um, of the two persons in the box and we found a pattern of light being emitted that was different for every healing session, never repeated. Some of them were quiet with virtually no photons. This one was particularly interesting because we've got three major peaks and these peaks correlated verbally with the healer saying, and now my guides have arrived. And yet again, uh, guides have arrived and, and the peaks went up then. And so that was interesting qualitative data that correlated with peaks of light coming out during the healing session, which was 20 minutes. And then we repeated the palm measurements afterwards and then uh, another baseline. So, button. <laughs> so here's a summary of some data from these runs. And I just want to point out a couple of things. And one is that sword fingers emission shown here in red are the largest emitters of the hands that we found, uh, 54 counts and 41 counts per uh, second uh, from a particular external chi practitioner really working with Taoist fingers. Um, both before and after. And basically you can see that the right hands in general, which are the first measurements from healers and a little bit also from patients, emit a little bit more light, 20.6 photons compared to 18.8. .8. Now that's highly significant because we're counting really millions of photons uh, over the course of, or we have the capacity to count millions of photons, but uh, we have found that even one photon difference is significant. Uh, statistically in these measurements. So a couple of photons is really still significant. And according to oriental medicine theory, the left hand is more of a receiver, and the right hand, the yang hand, is the giver of energy. So it it's really proves, in fact, oriental medicine theory known for 5,000 years. And just to um, show you a little bit about statistics, so to answer the question, what happens before and after energy healing, the healer's energy went down about 11% from the palm of the hands. Um, right and left hand decreased 11%. The patients did not show such a significant decrease in energy pre-post healing. So let me move on. We also did some pilot, pilot studies on individual subjects who engaged in specific psychoenergetic states. Uh, and our research question was, does intention to change one's psychoenergetic state correlate with a change in biophoton emission? So here is uh, a woman, age 57, medical intuitive, opening and closing her third eye. Excuse me a minute. 
And we did this in a couple of trials as people get fatigued, um, overwhelmed with it. But uh, with closed eyes, 20 photons per second per square centimeter were emitted from this region, which is known as the third eye in esoteric circles. And in the open condition, 41.2 photons. So that's a change of 106%, and it happened really quickly. Uh, now, as it turns out, we also measured, but I don't have the data here, changes in her, whether, whether there were any changes in the right palm, her heart, and abdominal regions, and there were no such changes. So it was highly specific to this region, which is, of course, associated with intuition. And we had a, another subject who, uh, a male, age 54, an advanced practitioner from the International Academy of Consciousness, also a teacher and researcher, performing a technique that they teach called the Voluntary Energetic Longitudinal Oscillation, or the VELO. Velo. And in this case, we also measured uh, his right palm, his left palm, his heart region, and forehead. And what changed in particular was his heart area. The heart area increased photon emission from 9.8 to 37.4, almost 300%. And whereas his other um, major emitter regions, the forehead, the right palm, left palm, did not show as much change. So something is going on here that's correlated apparently with intention and psychoenergetic state. I should also mention that the attitude toward biophoton emission by the mainstream um, biomedical worldview is that it's some junk light, that it's basically due to free radical chemistry, uh, reactive oxygen species, and that it has no significance, that it's uh, purely um, junk from bioluminescence in the organism. But yet when you see a shift due to intent, you have to say there's got to be something more going on when you get changes like 300 percent. So. So the conclusions from this pilot study, various psychoenergetic exercises can alter biophoton emission from specific regions of the body, sometimes according to intention. And I'm going to move along to another method, high voltage electrophotography. This started as Kirlian photography in Russia. And we have Stanley Kripner who researched that for many decades, a long time ago. And, um, I'm well aware of his good work. And now it's moved from film to digital photography, as photography has in general. So it's no longer film-based, it's digital. And there's commercial products. This is one, the BioWell, which is really a good window into the biofield. Because not only is it making photographs of the fingertips, but there's an enormous database now of people who have been measured, sick people as well as well people. And they've mapped. Uh, sectors along the finger emissions that correspond to organs and tissues, and they can say a lot about your health. And in fact, this instrument is a diagnostic instrument in Russia, although it's not in the United States because of FDA issues. And I brought this device the other day and measured some of you. I haven't yet uh, been able to send out those, uh, the data to you, but I will get it to you. So BioWell analyzes an induced light emission called the corona discharge. When you place any object on a very highly charged plate uh, on the order of 5,000 to 15,000 volts, uh, an induced light is emitted called the corona discharge. Here you can see it a little bit. We're kind of peeping into the device to show you that the finger would emit light. You don't really feel a shock as you would with the old Kirlian photography. It's not as high a voltage. and. So conceptually, a circle of light around the fingertip is produced. Uh, this goes through a clear glass electrode down and is sensed by a charge couple detector, a CCD camera, the basis of digital photography today. And then, um, but almost in real time, you get an image uh, then sent via USB to uh, a computer notebook or laptop. And then you can analyze it using enormously powerful software I'll show you a little bit about that. Of course, the BioWell corona discharges are, well, anyway. OK, here are the BioWell scans of all 10 fingers. They're computer colorized because they're only in black and white. And then these are analyzed according to sectors that Russians have discovered correspond to different tissues and organs. And they, they are completely transparent about this. It's all revealed in the software. There are no hidden software algorithms. It's, it's totally 
transparent and utilized even in dissertation research at universities. I have two students at Saybrook using this in their doctoral dissertations right now. And here's an example of the mapping of organs. Uh, you see the thyroid, the thymus, the pancreas, et cetera, and very specific sectors of a particular finger, which the Russians have elucidated over hundreds of thousands of persons studied for decades now since Kirlian photography was discovered back around 1948. So, and then they show an organ diagram of the distribution of the energy of the biofield uh, from each of the 10 fingers from the left hand in the various left organs and on the right from the right hand. And ideally, it should be in the green circular zone, and um, that red line traces the individual fingerprint of this person's energy distribution. And you can see how this shifts over time with different health interventions or mind-body practices. So I'll just show you some examples of composite biofields from BioWell assessment. And one of the things I found was that if someone is practicing uh, one of the spiritual practices of the East for about two years and regularly, they are extremely well regulated in the biofield. But here's a beginner of yoga, and you can see the energy deficit along the legs uh, and a rather irregular pattern of energy. These composite biofields, again, are produced from all 10 fingers, uh, according to the sector analysis, and the same woman after one hour of yoga, much improved. Again, a regular pattern of energy that corresponds to smooth circles of light emitted by each finger would be correlated with the smooth, unimpeded flow of chi, which is the ideal, according to Oriental medicine. And it's blocks that happen and irregularities that signify uh, problems or potential problems in health and wellness. Now here's a yogi, 20 years of practice, before and after yoga. The only change I can see here, and we, we of course can analyze these quantitatively, is a change in his back emission. Uh, the back looks a little bit um, irregular here, but it fills out here. So you get to see the expanded state of a well-regulated practitioner uh, of a mind-body-spirit practice. And here's just another example. A woman, age 57, a beginner, studying wild goose qigong, which is a qigong well-known for health and wellness, looks rather irregular and distorted on the left, but after doing qigong is much improved. And here's an example of what happens when you expose someone to an electromagnetic stressor, such as a, a smartphone. And this is, uh, actually this one is a computer. Um, this person came to me desperate because they were so electro-hypersensitive living in um, a penthouse in a high riser in San Francisco exposed to radio waves, cell phone towers, etc., and couldn't even sit at her computer anymore. So she came in, and you looked very good energetically, but after one hour at her own notebook computer, you can see how distorted the biofield is. And we see this regularly, especially in electro hypersensitive persons. So we can uh, see energetically how people are, are affected by stressors as well as by. Um, medicaments or homeopathics brought near the biofield. They don't even have to take them. Something held in the hand will either strengthen or reduce your biofield potentially. Here's another case where we brought, uh, this is a different way of looking at the data, but um, we brought, gave someone a smart phone to hold for 45 minutes and work with it. Typically this person held it in one hand and worked with the other hand uh, and found as a result uh, we saw that the balance in the uh, left-right was, was greatly affected by using a smartphone held in one hand, worked with the other. So that's very common, and we don't know the net result of people using these devices over the long run, but I don't think it's healthy. <laughs> so here's me, for example, after sitting and writing that big, fat NIH grant proposal so many years ago, uh, disheveled, uh, poor circulation in the legs, too much sitting, broken-hearted, really disheveled, but I gave myself electroacupuncture with a device I bought in Japan, and presto, I, I look much better. So it just shows you how these, inter these energetic interventions can impact the biofield. And of course, if you maintain that new pattern, then the flesh and blood follow, and healing ensues, and so that's the idea. Again, it's 5,000 years old, but now we're visualizing it with scientific tools. And here's another example from uh, right middle finger of a person with a lot of stress, 
uh, female, age 26, you can see our irregular, the finger images, it ideally is a perfect circle of light. And even after a placebo, a sugar pill, there's an improvement. But after post-acupressure, the improvement is better than placebo. So that's the kind of data we often see. Um, and again, this corresponds to her biofield improved. And uh, now here's another example. This is an energy healer. What do energy healers look like in this type of photography? And this particular energy healer is an external chi practitioner. He emits very strong energy, even bone melting according to some of the practices, literally reconfiguring noses. Uh, instead of plastic surgery, they move chi. And during energy sending, you can see how much brighter and uh, sparky and uh, high fractality, uh, discrete sparks. And this is the same person in the resting state. So it's dramatic. So we can also do a quantitative parametric analysis. I'm not doing that here for you, but we analyze innumerable parameters from the area illuminated of pixels, the light energy in joules. These are standard physics units. These, the density or the, the circularity of the light coming from around the fingertip, the fractal dimensionality, the entropy, the left to right energy distribution, and uh, the sector analysis. So all of that is part of the quantitative analysis, and then we do statistics. So we're not just showing pretty pictures, but I am here today for lack of time. So here's a question. How does Qigong practice affect the biofield? And here's a man, age 77, with Parkinson's disease. Now, it's interesting, Parkinson's disease, of course, is a disease of the brain. And you see a very peculiar uh, biofield image over the head. And after doing an hour of Qigong, he really looks more normal. And I'll just show you what the fingers look like that correspond to uh, the head, because fingers 3L and 3R uh, are largely uh, the top of the head. And here they are before and after Qigong, uh, left and right. And you can see expanded and uh, that fuzzy white light indicating uh, better energy regulation. Here's more quantitative analysis showing that the area, this is pre and post, pre, post, pre, post. So the area of light emission from these two fingers went up dramatically and the density, the circularity of light also improved and fractality, the discrete sparkiness went down. So that's typically what we see when energy regulation is improved. And now we're moving on. I have, uh, Harry has um, had a contract to develop a custom digital curling and camera uh, for imaging phantom limbs and phantom leaves. And I'll just say a few words about it because we wanted a larger aperture. We want to look at what happens if a, a whole hand is gone or a whole foot. And so we need a big, big, bigger area of the lens to put down the limb. And people, of course, who've had a missing limb or who lose it in wartime or uh, for amputation regions sometimes experience sensations where there's no limb left, including pain. And it's a well-known syndrome called phantom limb pain. And nobody really understands this, but we thought we might be able to image the biofield of such a limb. So far, we have not done this with people, but we have tried with leaves. And there is a literature, by the way, of looking at phantom leaf phenomena, most recently published by John Hubacher in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine a few years ago. And so I'm working with a group. We're trying to replicate that in uh, uh, not only with this camera, but with a bunch of other custom cameras that we're building, because that would be the best evidence for the biofield, uh, I think, that if a phantom leaf, uh, and we have some trials of that here, for example, fresh ma maple leaf on the large aperture, and we have um, Indium, um, let's see, tin, indium tin oxide glass, which is a clear electrode on the glass. And so that's highly charged. The leaf is placed on that and then a piece of plexiglass on top. And the leaf is grounded by virtue of um, an electrode at the stem, then going to ground. And then you turn on the device for a second or, or less, and then you, you look for a curling image. So here, I'm not sure you can see that, but you can see the, the so-called curling or electro a photograph of a maple leaf uncut, and then we tried to get phantoms, so we cut the leaf, again cleaned everything so there's no water left from that leaf, and then we visualized it, but we only saw the cut. We didn't see the phantom of the whole leaf again, which we were hoping to see. So we're still working on this problem of, of visualizing phantom leaf and phantom limb. And here's with a nasturgium leaf, uh, a circular leaf, 
And then there it is, the uh, leaf with the cut, whereby the cut is seen. So, what am I doing for time? So the last thing I want to talk about is the sensor suite, and this is really um, our own development completely uh, that Harry Jabs built, uh, and we've been studying people with this. What is it? It's um, a group of sensors, three categories of them. We have environmental sensors because we're concerned about the interaction of geocosmic rhythms with the biofield. It's well known that you really can't draw a line between uh, our own bi body fields and Earth and uh, geocosmic fields because uh, it's really, nature is really one piece when you start talking about fields. You can't really say, here's the boundary of my field next to yours. We influence one another, and the geocosmos is influencing us, so it's, we just have a field in which we're embedded, in which we shine our own light, but these things interact. So we have environmental sensors, uh, magnetometers, uh, temperature, humidity sensors, alpha, beta, gamma detectors for radioactivity, uh, and we have peripheral physiological sensors. We have, uh, for example, galvanic skin response, which senses conductivity or sweat of fingers and is related to arousal. We have um, perfusion index being measured, uh, level of oxygen in the blood, and we have uh, the capacity to do HRV, although we haven't added that yet to the sensor uh, prototype. But then we have detectors that we call subtle energy detectors, that we have completely shielded from known energy possibilities. For example, in Faraday cages, uh, housed, uh, optically shielded, thermally shielded, et cetera, so that no conventional fields can get through. But, and, and we did this because we were looking for something beyond. We were looking for the proverbial subtle energy that went beyond uh, conventional uh, energies as we know it. And we have found things that apparently are either emitted by the human body or manipulated by the human body if there's the, these energies are surrounding us and that um, may be associated with the biofield. So we do this with real-time computer data acquisition and we have all the sensors feeding 24-7 and we're studying the biofield in conjunction then with geocosmic factors and shifts in consciousness. So here's an example of a subject at the sensor suite hooked up and being studied and um, we have a, demo a dynamic emotional detector. We have a detector that senses emotions, positive and negative, that is not on the body, but at, in the near field. It doesn't require a probe on the body. And that's an advance over GSR, which only senses arousal and cannot tell you whether positive or negative affect, and requires, of course, placement on the body. So we're very excited about this, and I see a lot of potential applications to consciousness studies to add a dimension of looking at the emotional uh, arousal and whether it's positive or negative in some of your research on consciousness. And I can imagine that we'll have biofeedback devices for levels of intention with emotional charge soon, and we're seeking funding right now for the next stage of R&D. So basically, what we'd like to do is map the human biofield. I have a team of people that really wants to do this, but we lack funding. As you know, we had the Human Genome Project, which led to the very uninspiring result that we have less genes than a grain of rice. And it can't all be there, folks. So we're looking to map the human biofield. If you know of any sources of funding, we'd be very grateful to move forward. And I have assembled quite a team internationally ready to do that. Publications are on our website, acknowledging certain foundations. There are also individuals who have helped us enormously. And I'd like to invite you to the U.S. Psychotronics Conference next month. If you're interested in devices and intention, that's our specialty. Thank you very much. for questions. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, question about biophotons. Uh, is the source of the biophoton, is there local heating associated with it, or is it a change in chemistry? Uh, what, what is the source? That's a good question. I, I know Fritz Pop believes it's the DNA. I'm not convinced that it's the DNA, the DNA and supercoiling states, et cetera. It is visible light. Our detector is sensitive 
from 350 to 650 nanometers. So we're looking at visible light, and we don't really understand the source. I think it's probably multiple. I don't think it's simple. So from a spectral response, you could see uh, luminescent peaks, and then you could also see a shift in the black body spectrum emission. And so you probably could distinguish, right? Well, the, the problem is. is we don't have a detector where we can distinguish those peaks in the visible spectrum. We would have to take apart the Hamamatsu device, and it's a, about a $3,000 device, and try to rework it uh, according to that or use filters. But the light is so low level that that might be difficult to really find those peaks. But I agree with you in principle, and we're, we are thinking about this deeply. Okay, we should talk. We, Thank we you. We do this in my lab. Okay. <laughs> If the biophotons are coherent, could their amplitudes be detected and perhaps a pattern be detected and measured to see what information, what kind of information is being transmitted? Well, you know, Fritz Pop thinks they're coherent. Uh, and quantum coherence of very low level light, I must admit, is a very tricky realm of um, squeezed light and quantum theory, and I don't understand it fully myself. So, um, what was the rest of your question? How to detect the amplitude of the biophoton in order to the Well, the amplitude is counting the photons is really a measure of the intensity or the amplitude. So what more, what more could you do along those lines? Well, perhaps to try to understand what they, what's the information pattern behind it. Yes. And I have to say, studies on human beings are really lacking. There's the work by Roland Van Wyck and his son and the prior work by Fritz Pop. There's very few laboratories. And then there's the lab here uh, um, with John in the Rhine Institute. I don't know of any, any other labs really doing this. So there's so many questions to be addressed, and we would love to address them. Again, funding is always an, uh, an issue and a great question. And how does the plasma SED detector work, the, the one for subtle energies? Well, actually, because we're patenting it, I'm not going to say much about it at this time because we're in progress of writing that patent. But we hope to get out a product. That's the plan. And we think it has a lot of application. And by the way, adding, measuring the biofield would really be a great addition to adding to your uh, physiological measures of psychoenergetic states that many of you are looking at what happens when psi is enhanced. What really is that state? And understanding the biofield, in addition to physiology, I think would be a tremendous addition to the research in general here. Thank you. Uh, for your UV studies, have you done any sham studies where you had uh, non-healers making the same motions and saying the same words as the healers and looking at the response? No, I haven't done any sham studies. There are certainly issues with sham studies because wherever there's a human being, there's a biofield. And you can say, I don't have intention, but I'm going to wave my hand and then think about elephants. But <laughs> I think there's problems with shams. I don't particularly enjoy doing sham controls with humans. Um, I study the biofield in my lab with a low frequency magnetometer, and I've actually seen changes with emotions, positive and negative emotions. You don't give us any details of your motion detector, I understand it's proprietary, but surely you could tell us whether you're doing a magnetic field or electric field. I mean, there's so many variations of those. Well, I told you already that that, that detector of, for the emotional dynamic detector is none of those energies. Is it part of the shielded part? Is that where you're... Well, it's, we shield the detector. Yeah, I understand. That's so how we're looking for something beyond conventional electromagnetism, so beyond electric, beyond magnetic, so beyond photon. It is a subtle energy detector, and so it has no conventional... Is your uh, subtle energy detector have a mu metal? I mean, how much are you getting rid of the low-frequency component? We're getting rid of everything. We've, we've measured that there's nothing there, and we even have thermistors in there to, to be sure the temperature's not going up. And acoustically, optically, electromagnetically, it's completely shielded. Yes, the magnetometer is constantly being monitored 24-7, as a matter of fact. Hi, Beth. Hi. You're doing amazing work. Really, really great work. Thank, Thank you, you John. That much. means a lot to me. Um, I have so many questions. 
keep it to two quick ones. One of them, do you see correlation between your electrical pho photography and your biophoton counts? Do, are you able to do that? And second, are you collecting qualitative data and trying to correlate that with the activity? We're going to start at adding more qualitative data. We had that the, those sentences from Healer spoken while in the chamber. Oh, my guides have arrived. Now the energy is really flowing. And yes, the peak is starting. So it's very important to have the qualitative and the quantitative data brought together in these studies. I'm all for you. And the other question was? Are you correlating the electrophotography with uh, the photon? You know, that's really tricky because you can't really run them at the same time. One is such a bright lighting mission, you can't pull it into the biophoton chamber. It would destroy the PMT. But uh, people are always fluctuating dynamically, too. But I can tell you that, in general, I, I don't expect that correlation. One is an induced light emission. The other is a natural light emission. And in all the various ways to analyze the biofield, I would say the only thing that I see in common between them is whether we can talk about autonomic balance. Sympathetic to parasympathetic ratio, we can analyze for this with the various, uh, even acupuncture, meridian stress. And I would say that is about the only thing that they have in common. I think we're going to have a lot more conversation. I look forward to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.